Greetings citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy little human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's morbid makeup video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this craziness today, you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer. And today we're going to be discussing one of the most brutal murders that I've ever heard of in my entire life. And that is the murder of James Bird Jr. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically, you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of us. <laughs> And you can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter if you want. They're both Bratterstein, but no pressure. All right, now that I'm done begging you to join my cult, we can get into this video and the story. Now, you may recall that I actually have mentioned James's case um, previously in my case on Matthew Shepard. If you may recall, or if you have not seen that video, Matthew Shepard's murder paved the way for new legislation to be put into effect um, to protect people and to make more severe punishments be put into place for hate crimes. As a result, in 2009, the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act was put into effect, and we're going to be discussing James Byrd Jr., the other half of the, um, the name of that act. And this case is incredibly rough. Um, I feel like if you're here, you kind of know it's going to be a rough ride. Like, you know what kind of channel it is. I've kind of let you know the the gist of what the case is going to be about but if you are particularly um sensitive uh just prepare yourself because this case is up and it's hard to hear but it's one of those ones that i think is important for us to hear considering it wasn't that long ago so with that said i'm going to tell you that story and while i do i'm going to put on a full face of makeup if that's not your thing that's cool that's fine thanks for hanging out this long i hope you find a video that fits your style more more effectively, properly, whatever you want. Uh, but if you are sort of on the fence like that sounds weird, I don't know how I feel. Maybe stick around. You might be surprised by how much you like it. Now come gather around and let me tell you the story of James Byrd Jr. and his unimaginable end. On the hot summer morning of June 8th, 1998, a motorist arrived at a primarily black church on Huff Creek Road and found the mutilated torso of a black man laying on the lawn in front of the church. When you looked past the torso, you could see that the street, as far as the eye could see, had a long, horrifying blood trail. It was three miles of unimaginable hell. And the torso that was found was that of 49-year-old James Byrd Jr. James Byrd Jr. was born May 2nd, 1949, making him a Taurus, and he was born in the small community of Jasper County, Texas. He was one of nine children born to his parents, James Byrd Sr., who was a deacon at a church, and Stella May, who was a Sunday school teacher. His family was very involved in the church, and this lasted well into his adult life as well. James attended Jasper Row High School, where he found his love for music, learning how to play a couple instruments and playing in the band. And just, he was the type of person who loved music his entire life. He was the type who was always singing, always having fun. And he first found this love while he was in high school at Jasper Row. And this is where he ended up graduating in 1967. And his graduating class was actually the last segregated class in his high school. So there was still segregation in his lifetime. And man, 1967, that really wasn't that long ago to think that there was like I know all of this history is there but when you really think about how that wasn't that long ago it's really disappointing after graduating high school James instead of going to college ended up actually getting married and he had three children Jamie Renee uh, those were his two daughters Jamie and Renee and then he had a son named Ross and he was just like a sweet and gentle man he was such like a like a big teddy bear type person that when his daughter was born prematurely, he was afraid to hold her because he was afraid he would hurt her. Through his life to support his family when he could, he worked as a vacuum salesman actually. And in 1993, just five years before his tragic death, him and his wife actually separated. 
got a divorce. James Byrd Jr. was known by almost everyone you talked to who knew him as just a lively person, a happy person, the color yellow, you know, he was just the life of the party, always smiling, always laughing, always walking around singing. He wanted to make it big as a musician and a songwriter and a singer in his life, and a lot of people who knew him and heard him sing thought he was good enough to actually do it. He was the type of person who was always the first to chat you up. If he saw you on the street, he would just come over and he'd start talking to you. He was an active member in his church. He was an active member in his community. He was just like a very present figure in his small town. He was a beacon of light and friendship to all of those who knew him. He was a man. He was a father, he was a son, he was a brother, he was a love, and he was stolen from this world. And I'm not going to leave out the things about James's past that are less than ideal, because if I do, I will without fail have some d-bags in the comments who are like, oh, you're romanticizing somebody who wasn't even a good person. I get those comments, and it's so horrible, but here's the thing. Just because somebody makes mistakes doesn't mean that they're a bad person or they deserve anything that happens to them. So though James was a good man, he did get in trouble from time to time and he did spend some time in jail for petty crimes like theft and forgery. So I'm going to mention it so that nobody gets upset that I didn't mention it, but it has literally nothing to do, um, it literally has nothing to do with what happened to him. So moving on, just keep that in mind, you know, no one's perfect everyone makes mistakes. So I don't want to see like negative comments about James on this video. I don't want to see people trying to justify what happened to him because he wasn't a good person. Just because you make mistakes doesn't mean you're not a good person. And most of us, if we were held under a microscope with every single thing that we had ever done in our lives, we wouldn't look like the best people. It doesn't make him a bad person. It doesn't mean his life is worth any less than anyone else's. And it doesn't make what happened to him justifiable. And I know most of you are cool. We have like a cool thing going on here, but the nature of YouTube is that it's a public platform. So any person can walk in here, say some dick bag shit, and then walk right out and flee into the night and never come back or have to deal with the fact that they are just being a terrible person. And it's fine. I know assholes exist, but you don't have to announce yourselves. Thank you. The last time that James was released from jail was just a couple of years before his death and he had really been working on trying to just get his life together. He had gotten his own apartment so that he would have a nice place of his own for his kids to come and visit them because I believe by this point they were mostly adults. So he had like this nice place so that they'd have a place to come visit him. And though he couldn't work because he had had a previous injury and I did read in some places he also had an issue with seizures that made it difficult for him to work. So he was living on disability checks but for some additional money and to just keep himself busy he was also in mowing neighbors lawns to try to get a little extra cash. He was just a man, you know, a human being just trying to get it together and maybe he would have, maybe everything would have turned out just wonderful for him. But he'll never know and will never know because the chance was stolen from him by a couple of Nazi bucks. The day that James was killed, he had actually been at a family gathering during the day, which I think in hindsight, though it's like sad to be so close right before somebody dies, I think that it's kind of lucky that he had that opportunity, you know, like, ugh, like a happy last day. He got to see his parents. He got to see his siblings. He got to see his kids. His daughter was visiting from out of state with his one grandchild. And I think that that's very lucky that he got to have that last day with them and that they got to have that last day with him. On June 7th, 1998, just a month after his 49th birthday, James Beard Jr. was murdered by three white supremacists. So James did not drive. And since he did not drive, he was walking down the street trying to get home. He had just got, been over at a friend's house. He had gone to a party at a friend's house after um, the gathering with his family. And people said that his last night was filled with fun, laughter, smiling, dancing, a real contrast to what would happen to him next. While walking down this road, James was picked up in a truck by a group of three men. 23-year-old Sean Barry, who was driving the truck, and knew James from around town, and two of his friends, 31-year-old Lawrence Brewer and 23-year-old John King. These men then, instead of taking James home, drove out to a deserted country road. 
They ripped him from the truck. They jumped him. They spray painted his face black and then they urinated and defecated on him. John King, who was thought to be the ringleader later, which we'll get into, stated during the attack, and I quote, we're starting the Turner Diaries early. And what he was referring to is a book written by William Pierce, who was a known famous neo-Nazi and white supremacist. And this book for a super duper Cliff Notes version is essentially a tale of the genocide of racial minorities and is referred to as the Bible of the racist right and a handbook for white victory. So a bunch of actual racist bullshit. And this is what he said to him. This is what he said to James while attacking him, a black man. And once James Byrd Jr. lay on the ground, beaten, humiliated, and destroyed, John King, Sean Barry, and Lawrence Brewer took a large chain. They wrapped this around James's ankles and chain took the other end of that chain and put it on the end of the truck, the bed of the truck, and then drove for three miles down the asphalt. While being drug, James's body ended up hitting the edge of a culvert, which is like the street drain, and this severed his right arm and head from his body, killing him. After that, the three drove, drugging his headless and armless body for another mile and a half, and then dumped James's remaining torso in front of the primarily black church, and then drove to a barbecue. Apparently these absolute dicks weren't even like planning to do anything this night. They didn't go out that night looking for somebody. Apparently they had been, they left their apartment because they had been getting into trouble with their landlord by having some parties. I read that they were in, about to be evicted, which literally doesn't matter, but that's why they had left the house and they went out like looking for women. They were like, let's go find some girls, even though I believe John King actually had a pregnant girlfriend living at home at the time living with him. But like, why would you ever put it past this person to be a piece of shit when they would do something like this? And, you know, they just happened upon James and he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Actually, no, I hate that saying that I've been thinking about that saying recently. And John, uh, James was not in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was in a perfectly safe place, a place he should have felt perfectly safe in just walking down the street. These dicks were in the wrong place doing the wrong thing at any time. But that's just me getting a little heated, but they saw him alone on a dark, isolated road. He was intoxicated from having drinks at his friend's party. And they were like, huh, let's have some fun. And this was these men's idea of fun. These three men were demons. And I'm going to give you a little bit more information right now. That's going to be really difficult to hear. And it just shows the horror and what absolute monsters these men were. And that's that through a lot of this dragging, James was still alive. He was alive until he hit that culvert. And forensic evidence showed that he had been not just alive, but awake, conscious enough to be propping himself up higher on his elbows to protect his head while he was being dragged. So for a mile and a half, he was alive and awake and could feel all of that and knew what was happening to him. And that is just an unimaginable horror. When I think about that, I have goosebumps just thinking about it because it's, I can't think of a worse way to die. Most of his ribs were fractured, but his head and his skull and his face had a surprising lack of damage. And that again, suggests that he was awake and holding his head up. His body was so badly beaten, as I'm sure you can imagine that a visual identification was just not even in the cars. It wasn't going to, there, there was no way. So he had to be identified by his fingerprints because fortunately some of those were still intact. Now, before we get into the investigation and the aftermath, let's talk about these three men a little bit who did this. Let's talk about why they, why they suck among, you know, there's lots of reasons they suck, but let's talk about their backstory a little bit and each of their roles in this murder. John William King was born November 3rd, 1974, making him a Scorpio. Again, we don't claim him. He was the man who the other two said beat James with a bat and then actually drove the truck while dragging James. John King was a piece of shit. He had just gotten out of prison at the time he committed the murder. And he claimed as a sort of defense that he was frequently gang raped by black prisoners in jail. So it wasn't that he hated black people. He was just triggered. 
Okay. If that's the case, King, then why did you get a bunch of horribly racist tattoos in your life, like one of a black man hanging from a tree with a clansman, clansman, clans fuck standing next to it, mm -hmm. and a bunch of other Nazi tattoos, swastikas, I think he had the double lightning bolts, and the words Aryan pride. Okay. And besides that, if you didn't, you know, do it because he was black and it wasn't like a hate crime, then why did you write a letter to your buddy Lawrence Brewer while you were in jail, talking about how proud you were of the crime, saying, and I quote, regardless of the outcome of this, we have made history. Death before dishonor. Say Kyle. Get fucked. And now speaking of your buddy Lawrence Brewer. Lawrence Russell Brewer was born March 13th, 1967, making him a Pisces. Like his buddy John King, he was well known for being a white supremacist who had been in and out of jail, jail being where he first became friends with John King. They were both part of a white supremacist prison gang, and like King, he had a bunch of racist tattoos on his body, like a burning cross and a confederate flag. This guy was a monster, and when he was eventually executed for his crime, spoiler alert, sorry, he was asked if he had any last words, any regrets, and he said of this, and I quote, as far as any regrets, no, I have no regrets. No, I'd do it all over again to tell you the truth. Oh, a little fun fact, if you will, about Lawrence Brewer. Well, he single-handedly ended the century, nearly century-old tradition of giving prisoners um, on death row in that area a, a last meal, because when his execution time came and they asked him what he wanted his last meal to be, he requested the most ridiculous last meal of all time. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to read it because it's long and I don't have it memorized. It included two chicken fried steaks with gravy and sliced onions, a triple patty cheeseburger, a cheese omelet with ground beef, tomatoes, onions, bell peppers, and jalapenos a bowl of fried okra with ketchup, one pound of barbecue meat with a half of a loaf of white bread, three fully loaded fajitas, a meat lover's pizza, one pint of bluebell vanilla ice cream, a slab of peanut butter fudge with crushed peanuts on top, and three root beers. A real modest meal. When this meal was brought to him for him to eat it, he told them he wasn't hungry. So all that food got thrown in the trash. Immediately, the state senator was like, well, fuck this. And he talked to the Texas um, prison administration or whatever and was like, stop giving last meals. This is it. We're done. And the prison was like, oh, hell yeah. And they effectively stopped giving prisoners the choice of their last meal. All right. Last, we have Sean Barry, the man who knew James, the man that made James comfortable enough to even get in the truck to take that ride. Sean Barry was born February 12th, 1975, making him an Aquarius. And when he ended up being arrested, he claimed that he had nothing to do with what happened. He was just there and had no idea what his friends were planning to do. He didn't have any obvious tattoos like the other two, but he did have a tattoo that said brotherhood. And that definitely feels related, but it could never be proven that he was part of any white supremacist group. Additionally, Sean actually shared an apartment with both John and Lawrence, and when that apartment was searched, the, the walls were covered with like Nazi shit, like posters and stuff. And that was like proudly displayed in the apartment. And on top of that, Lawrence and John said that Sean actually was the mastermind behind the murder, that Sean had actually cut James's neck before they started to drive so that they were actually dr dragging him dead. But this was never proven. If anything, it was disproven by the fact that there wasn't as much um, damage to his skull, to his, to his head, to James's head. But I don't see how they could really prove whether or not his throat was cut beforehand, considering what had happened to his body. But that is uh, what they tried to say. So once police arrived at the church, when James's body was found, they had the seemingly impossible task of trying to identify these human remains. And I can't even imagine what that was like considering the state of his body, dude. Like I, my brain cannot compute that trauma and just that task. It doesn't seem like a possible thing to do to me. They started by following the bloody trail to try to find more pieces of James, pieces of James's body. And along the way, police marked off 75 places where they found either things that belong to James or pieces of James. Along the trail, they found James's shoes, his shirt, his keys, his wallet, and his dentures. And when they got to the end of the blood trail, they found an area that was clearly disturbed and it looked like there was a sign of a struggle or a fight happening there, you know, like drag marts in the dirt. I'm sure you can imagine what it was like. 
Here, they also found something that would help police be led to the murderers, and this was a, I believe it was a wrench, and it had the last name Barry on it. And I don't want to even think about why a wrench was there, because I never found anything that said what it was, that it was used in the beating, but knowing that a baseball bat was used. <sighs> so the three men were actually arrested just one day, just the very next day after James's body was found, but they actually weren't arrested for James's murder. They were arrested for the possession of stolen property, I believe, because a restaurant excuse me, had been robbed and inside their home a bunch of like meat was found because apparently these guys just stole a bunch of meat. Okay. And so they were in jail just for that. But while in jail for that, the James Bird Jr. case was closing in on them because they had found the wrench and they had also searched these men's apartment and they had searched Sean's truck, which was the truck that was used during the commission of the murder. And as I'm sure you can imagine, that truck was just filled with evidence inside and out. They found James's blood splattered all over the outside of the truck, as I'm sure you can imagine. And inside they found more Nazi bullshit. They found a lighter that had KKK written on the outside of it. And apparently this lighter belonged to John King, not Sean Barry, but it was in Sean's truck. So that could lead them to John King. The community of Jasper was shocked by this crime because though racism in general has always been super prevalent and in a lot of places still is at this time in this area it was seen it it seemed to be a more progressive place than most close by places the population in the area was about 50 percent black um, many people who were higher up in government and like the local doctor were all black americans as well so it was just kind of shocking for the community that something this horrifying could happen here, but that just is a perfect example of this can happen anywhere. And though this area seemed to be more progressive and wasn't outwardly racist, it just showed them that there were racists in their area hiding in plain sight. And that I think is a takeaway that we could still acknowledge because I think that still rings true today, at least in my opinion. Hundreds of people attended James Burr Jr.'s funeral, and at the funeral, his family asked that no one there carry any hate or animosity towards the men who murdered James. And, oh man, that's amazing to me because I, I, I say it like in almost every video where the family is just so wonderful that I don't think I would be so big, and I can't imagine having that much love inside of you to not wish ill on the people who did something so horrible. Just a few days after James's funeral, the KKK decided that it would be just the best idea ever to hold a protest outside the courthouse in Jasper. Apparently this was a demonstration to show their dis dissatisfaction with the fact that the media was saying that these three men who kill James were a part of the KKK because apparently even the KKK did not want to claim them. And so the KKK showed up and walked up and down the street with their stupid fucking little hoods. And in a response to that, the Black Panthers were like, hold my beer. And they showed up to try to combat any sort of violence that would happen at the hands of the KKK being in the area. So this was just absolutely fucking crazy. I cannot imagine. I, I literally cannot imagine. <laughs> so back to these men. All three men were brought up on murder charges and all three pled not guilty. Once arrested, Sean Barry almost immediately confessed to everything. Well, everything except for any involvement on his part. He said that everything that happened was done by John King and Lawrence Brewer and that when they started to beat James, he had actually ran away and was like hiding really far away. Like he was nowhere near the scene. And when police were like, hmm, How's it possible that you were like running and hiding in like some bushes and shit if James's blood was all over your clothes? And he was like, okay, okay, okay. I wasn't like running and hiding. I was kind of close by, but like I didn't touch him. I don't think I believe Sean. I don't think I believe Sean. I think Sean knew they didn't have as much evidence against him and that he couldn't be tied to any racist organizations. But I don't really believe that he wasn't involved, but that's just my opinion. As uh, Stephanie Harlow would say, don't come for me. Later, John King came out and said that it was actually Sean Barry who was the initiator, the ringleader. He was the one who, 
who knew James and he said that him and James, that Sean and James actually had like a drug issue together and that this was all over a drug debt. But just for clarity, cause I feel like someone's gonna be like, well, that's it. That's what really happened. This was looked into and there was no way to link James and Sean together in that way. And James wasn't linked to drugs, period, as far as police were concerned. So there you go. The only person who said this was true at all was a dickhead racist trying to save his own skin. So John King just did everything he could. He also tried to say that this wasn't racially motivated at all, but like, sir, <laughs> sir, who do you think you are fooling? That's what I would like to know. It was decided that the three men would have separate trials and John King's trial was first. So as I said, John's trial was first, but this guy was apparently incredibly difficult, problematic. He had several defense attorneys quit on him. Maybe it's because of how combated he was. Maybe it's because they were like, shit, this guy's guilty as hell and my conscience is getting me. It's probably not that one, but that would be me speculating here. And um, his trial didn't help because there was just a ton of evidence against this guy. But the thing is, is they had to prove, the uh, prosecution had to prove that it was John King who actually took part in it and wasn't just there and it wasn't one of the other two guys that just did all of it. You know what I'm trying to say? So that's the thing when there's like several people being tried, it's complicated because it's you have to prove that this specific person took part in the murder and wasn't just there. Fortunately though, there was plenty of evidence that showed that he was active in the crime and was right there when it was happening. There was, you know, James's blood on John's clothes and John's DNA on items found at the crime scene. So, and in addition to that, he was stupid and he wrote like all these like racist, all these letters just showing how racist and how horrible he was and how proud he was of the crime. And it, he wrote them to, to Lawrence Brewer, the other guy who was involved. And it's like, did he think that these would never be read or did he just not care? That's, I, I don't know if he thought he was just so smart or if he thought that these were confidential, but they were read. 24 year old John King was found guilty and he was given the death sentence and he was the first white man to be given the death sentence for killing a black man, I believe in the whole history of Texas, at least since the death penalty had been reinstated, instated, it was a big deal. Lawrence Brewer's trial was next and Lawrence's trial was pretty similar to John's in that they had a ton of evidence against him. He had the blood on his clothes and he too wrote a bunch of letters, not just to John King, but also to friends outside of prison, just talking about how awesome it was to murder James Ford Jr. At his trial, he did try to save himself. He did try to say that it wasn't him and it wasn't John King who had, you know, initiated or killed James. It was all Sean Barry, that Sean Barry had gotten out, that Sean Barry had cut his throat, that Sean Barry had chained him to the truck, but all of this was proven to not be true. And Lawrence is so stupid because he also wrote letters talking about how he and John should just blame the whole thing on Sean to get out of being convicted. Sir, 31 year old Lawrence Brewer was found guilty and he too was sentenced to death. Last was Sean Barry and Sean Barry's trial was very controversial out of all of them. His was the most like back and forth because a lot of people actually did believe that he didn't actively take part in the murder, that he too was just in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people. I don't know if I believe that his story went back and forth a lot. And I just kind of think he, he was trying to save his own skin, but I don't know for sure. That's just, my speculation based on what I've read. He says that he was scared, that he froze, that he didn't know what to do. He said once he was finally able to actually move, he actually tried to break up the fight, hence the blood on his clothes, and that the guys told him that if he didn't stop trying to help James, that he would be killed as well. But I mean, Sean changed his story with every bit of new information that was presented in front of him, and this was his truck. There were blood, there was blood on his clothes. He's the one who knew James. And here's the thing. Here's what, here's my thought process here. Let's say that he had no idea that this was going to happen, right? No, no idea whatsoever. What exactly did he think was going to happen? Cause he was the one driving when they picked James up. What exactly did he think was going to happen when he picked a black man up, 
driving with two white supremacists, two men that he lived with, that he knew hated black people simply for being black. What did he think was going to happen? I don't believe him. 23-year-old Sean Barry was found guilty, but unlike his friends, he was not given the death penalty. He was given life in prison, and he will be eligible for parole in 2038. June of 2038, to be exact. Lawrence Brewer was killed by lethal injection on September 21st, 2011. And as I said before, he claimed he had no regrets for what he did. And despite several um, attempts at appeal, John King followed him and was also executed on April 24th, 2019. Apparently, Sean Barry has actually spoken to members of James Byrd Jr.'s family. I know I saw something, I watched a documentary on it, and his son Ross actually, I believe, went and visited Sean Barry in prison, which is just like fucking crazy to me. And Sean Barry has told his side of the story and apologized for what happened and apologized for his part in it. And his, his son Ross said that Sean did seem sincere, which is like, okay, I don't know if I care, but my feelings are very irrelevant when it comes to this case and his son's feelings obviously trump mine in all ways. I just I don't know if I care if he feels bad or if, you know, he seems sincere. In May of 2004, two white teenagers named Joshua Lee Talley and John Matthew Fowler were arrested and charged with criminal mischief for desecrating James Burr Jr.'s grave by writing racial slurs and profanities. This was in 2004. They ended up putting a fence around his grave to protect it from people doing that. I just want to say, like, who fucking raised you, man? I know that it's not always the parents. Some kids just absolutely suck. Some kids are influenced by their shitty little friends, but it's just so, so upsetting. And I know at least in this case, I believe it was, um, speaking of like the parents thing, I believe it was John King's father said that he essentially said how horrible he thought what his son did and that this, this act and this person who did this is not the kid that he raised. And he put out this like heartfelt apology when it first happened, when his son was just sitting there silently bragging to his friends about how proud he was. His dad was like, I'm so fucking sorry. Like, I don't know what to say, but I'm so sorry. And it did seem heartfelt. So it's not always the parents, but fuck these teenagers, man. Sometimes I guess people just go bad, but you know what? Fuck them kids. Who does that? You desecrated the grave of a man who's dead. He's gone forever, and he died in one of the worst possible ways that a person could ever think of. Like, imagine it, just for like one second, being chained by your ankles and dragged down an asphalt road until you were dead, feeling so much of it, and these kids desecrated his grave. Fuck them kids. I say with complete disrespect, fuck them kids. So something good did come out of this case, like a silver lining, I guess. Due to the manner that James was killed in, and due to the reasoning behind the murder, it was dubbed a modern day lynching by dragging, and it paved the way for new legislation. And the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act was passed on October 22nd, 2009, and was signed into law by President Obama on October 28th, 2009. If you remember, we talked about this act being passed in my Matt Shepard video, another horrible, horrible hate crime. Basically, this act expands the 1969 United States federal hate crime law to include crimes motivated by a victim's actual or perceived gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability. At the time that both Matt Shepard and James Burr Jr. were murdered, their states didn't have laws like that in effect at all. And I did a lot of, you know, research obviously on this case. And in doing so, I looked into this act and I was really sad because I learned that this act is, is often just referred to as the Matthew Shepard Hate Crimes Prevention Act and completely omits James Burr Jr.'s name altogether. And it was really sad um, to learn that. I even looked up the act on congress.gov and the short title, like what it's referred to is just the Matt Shepard Hate Crimes Prevention Act. And there's no mention of James Burr Jr. at all. And you can just do with that information what you will. But it was a bummer for, for me to see. 
Three of James Burr Jr.'s sisters released a statement around the time of his death um, talking about what happened, and uh, I'm going to read part of their statement here. Having a loved one tortured and lynched produced an unimaginable sense of loss and pain. How does one respond to such a brutal act? James's youngest daughter, Jamie, um, said that when it first happened, she wanted to take those three men and drag them behind a truck, just like they had done to her father. At the time that he was killed, she was only 16. Um, and since then, her rage has been replaced with drive and passion. And she actually works for the police department now. She said of her younger self and her feelings, and I quote here, I didn't know whether I should hate or whether I should forgive. I had to come to grips with that. James's family created the James Bird Foundation for racial healing after his death. Basketball star Dennis Rodman paid their funeral expenses and gave James Bird's family $25,000. Fight promoter Don King gave Bird's children $100,000 to put towards their education expenses. Since his death, there has actually been a park that was named for James, and it's named the James Bird Jr. Memorial Park. His family actually celebrated his life um, at that park on the 20th anniversary of his death. And on that day, a, a bench was erected in his honor. And I'm going to tell you the quote that's on the bench and kind of wrap up the video with that. The bench says, be the change that you want to see in the world. And that, my friends, is the story of the murder of James Bird Jr. And I'm going to give you a second to let that all sort of sink in. I know that it's so incredibly heavy and there's some cases that just like, like every case is bad. Every case is horrible. I never feel like great after any case, but there's some cases that after you finish talking about them, it's like you can't take a breath. You know what I mean? Here I am like breathing, but it's like you can't get that sigh of relief because there is no relief. It's just so incredibly unimaginable what happened to James. It, it doesn't even sound real. It sounds like something somebody made up, but it is real. It really happened. And can you even imagine that? Like think about the absolute worst pain you've ever been in in your entire life. Now think about what James went through before he died. It is incomprehensible. I'll never understand it. I'll never understand. Racist period. Racists period. It makes no sense to me. It's the type of thing that just doesn't compute in my brain because though all murders are horrible that you know they are and obviously we talk about it we know but something about hate crimes just really pissed me off they really hit different and i'm not gonna apologize for for being more affected you know what i mean like for something hitting me a little harder than others i just can't imagine living life like that like how fucking lame are you to live your life as a racist you know what i mean like that's fucking lame as hell to hate somebody because of the color of their skin. Uh, it's just so fucking stupid. And I'm thankful. I'm so thankful that I grew up in a family that raised me in a way that I don't have to constantly try to overcome generational racism. Like I'm eternally thankful for that. Not that I have no work to do because all people really do, but you know what I mean. It's just so fucked up and I feel so bad for him and I feel so bad for his family to have to know and to have to live with the knowledge that that's how his final moments were. I can't imagine that and I'm, I always say it, but I'm endlessly in awe of families who are strong enough to have something like that happen, take that information and move on with their lives in a positive way and not just lay down and die with them because I couldn't do it. I don't think I could. But anyways, guys, that completes this video. I hope you found it interesting and informative and you took something useful away from James's story. And of course, I want to thank you for hanging out and remembering James with me today because his case is a very important one that isn't widely recognized, not as widely as I believe it should be. When I went on YouTube and I searched his name, I was like, how's that even possible? It's one that we need to remember and we need to take away that Though people have come a long way, we're not done. Ooh, <laughs> horrible people with hate-filled hearts are hiding in plain sight everywhere. And to just be mindful and loving of the people around you, like everybody just love everybody. Please just, thank you. <laughs>
Of course, let me know of any cases you would like to see me cover down below, because as you know, I have a long list of cases, but every single time you leave a suggestion, I add it to my list with your name next to it so I can give you a shout out, because I know that you're filled with good taste and good ideas, otherwise you would not be here. If you have not already, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I'd love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you. And if you want to hang out more consistently, check down below. I've got all my social media listed down there. Instagram and Twitter are both Brad and I got a Facebook page and a Facebook group. And I'm always talking to everybody. I always respond to all comments. I always respond to DMs. Like I try to be as interactive as I possibly can. And I'd love to talk to you. So if you want to that's all down below along with the makeup I used, the earrings, in case you know you want to know where to get this bitchin' ass pink nail polish because god if this isn't gorgeous and then look at it next to these eyes I can't deal with it but it's all listed down below for your convenience. With all of that said thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world that is tight you are tight please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday at the very least work on being aggressively anti-racist. And with that, I'm going to see you hopefully in my next video. Bye.